indeed myself. So my name is Luke Whitington. I'm the Executive Officer of the Search Foundation. I'm your host for this event, which is being co-hosted by the New International Bookshop. Before we begin, please be aware that this briefing is being recorded so that we can post it later to the Search Foundation YouTube channel. And I'll post a link to that in the chat section. I've done it a few times already. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging, as we always do, that we are meeting here in Australia on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. This land was taken without consent, without treaty and without compensation. I pay my respects to Elders and emerging of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, traditional owners and First Nations all across the continent. I'm on Gundungurra and Darug land where we say Warami Gamarata, welcome comrades. We are very lucky to have Bernard Cleary with us tonight. But before I introduce Bernard, I'll tell you a little bit about the event. Uh, first, I'll tell you about the event, and I'll give you a 30 second introduction to Search and to the New International Bookshop, and then I'll do a one minute introduction of Bernard. Bernard then will then speak for up to 20, 25 minutes. Um, after that, we'll have que questions, which I invite you to submit in writing in the chat section to me directly. We'll wrap up on the hour when you can hang up or stay on the line for a few minutes to listen to a song, during which time you can post messages to everyone, including Bernard, in the chat section. To enable us to run this efficiently, all participants will be muted unless called upon to ask a question. After you've asked your question, uh, please mute yourself again. Please let me know if you are happy to ask your question yourself or if you would like me to ask it on your behalf. The chat section is limited to messages to me as the host, otherwise I won't be able to collate questions coming through. As mentioned, at the end of the meeting, you will be able to message everyone, including Bernard, and post any links or points you would like to make. If you'd like to discuss what is being said during the event, you can comment on the Facebook event page discussion board. I will post a link for that in the chat section. You'll have to use Facebook and Zoom at the same time, but hopefully that's not beyond your tech capabilities. So a quick intro to Search. Search is a membership-based democratic socialist organisation that links and enables socialist activists across political parties generations and movements around Australia. We have members from diverse backgrounds and interests, but we have common aims and values summarised in our aim of democratic ecological socialism. We run socialist education programs, publish news and views on Facebook and at search.org.au, and we put on events like this one. I encourage you all to like the Search Facebook page to keep up with our events and go to search.org.au if you are interested in applying for membership or simply get in touch with me to talk about what Search does. Our contact details are on the website and our Facebook page. Many search members have a long history of involvement with Timor Leste. I would like to particularly acknowledge Andy Alcock, who is Information Officer for the Australia East Timor Friendship Association South Australia, who helped us put this event together. Also, it is important to acknowledge the work of Unionated Broader Feeder and its Executive Officer Kate Lee for all their work in Timor Leste. Both those organisations are good places to take practical steps to assist the people of East Timor. Our partner in tonight's event is the New International Bookshop based at the Victorian Trades Hall in Melbourne. They are currently closed but will reopen soon and have Bernard's book Oil Under Troubled Water published by Melbourne University Press available for sale online. I'll post the link to that in the chat section or you can find it in the event description on Facebook. Nibs, as it's affectionately known, is a quality bookshop that stocks left progressive books and merchandise from all over the world, maintaining a fantastic secondhand book section covering all genres and running regular events aimed at fostering debate and discussion on the Melbourne left. They are also opening a cafe soon at Trades Hall. Their online book section is excellent and, as I said, includes Bernard's book. So, to introduce Bernard Cleary. Bernard Cleary is an Australian solicitor and barrister who specialises in litigation in high-profile catastrophic personal injury cases. He is active for families of victims of the Threadbow landslide, the Royal Canberra Hospital demolition tragedy, the Glenbrook Rail disaster in the Blue Mountains, the fire aboard HAS West Australia and the tragic loss of an RAF F-111 in the South China Sea. Throughout his career as a solicitor, advocate and politician, Bernard has been a fearless advocate for human rights. During his tenure as Attorney General of the Australian Capital Territory, he introduced an independent law reform process that culminated in the drafting of human rights legislation, including anti-discrimination legislation. Bernard advised the East Timor resistance for more than 30 years providing advice on international law and other matters during the United Nations Transitional Administration from 1999. He acted for East Timor at the International Court of Justice in relation to a maritime sea boundary dispute with Australia. Currently, Bernard is a patron and honorary solicitor of various charitable and non-profit organisations serving Indigenous Australians 
and marginalised sections of the sectors of the community. He's with us to talk about his book, Oil Under Troubled Water, Australia's Timor Sea Intrigue. Welcome, Bernard, and over to you. Good evening, Luke, and hi to Andy Alcock, Kate Lee, and all the other stalwarts of this uh, issue, Luke. Uh, look, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm honoured to be on your uh, program. It's um, great to get the uh, word out. Uh, I didn't write that book. Uh, as a as a fee earning author, and so I'm be quite open about promoting issues that the book relates to, without having any particular interest in whatever comes of the book in terms of any any earnings. So I don't want to. I'd hate to think people think I'm just spruiking my book tonight. I'm thirty thirty five, nearly forty years into this issue, and. Um, and it's affecting my life significantly at the moment because I guess most of uh, all, all participants know that I'm facing trial in my own court. I'll be in my own dock that I've spent a lot of my career in uh, as a person charged with conspiracy to reveal information uh, uh, relating to uh, the intelligence service. Now, Luke, um, that's a bit of a blanket on what I can say, of course, but uh, people ask me how, how I came to Timor. Well, firstly, I didn't come to Timor because a so-called whistleblower came to my office. Um, indeed, the question as to whether uh, that person uh, who was approved to see me, and I was approved to see that person, as to why the government would approve that person to see me against the background of 30 years work and direct advising to the Timorese leadership is something yet to be resolved and clarified. And, and so that's the current issue with me facing trial in Supreme Court. But let's come back to the Timorese who really are central to this. Uh, Timor Island is shared between, was shared between the Dutch and the Portuguese. And uh, Indonesia achieved its independence uh, not long after the Second World War. And Portuguese Timor remained in a time warp uh, right through to the mid seventies when it was occupied by Indonesia with tacit approval from Australia and encouragement from uh, President Ford and Secretary of State Kissinger. And the story of that occupation period is a story of genocide. And as Clinton, Professor Clinton Fernandez writes, Australia looked the other way while genocidal actions took place, starvations, and um, extermination uh, through other measures of significant portions of the community occurred. So how do we, how does Australia get to that? How, given our own background as a community uh, that believes it's fought for a fair go, how, how did Australia come to be no better than any colonial power. How, how is it that Australia is, has been in respect of its relations in our region, a neo-colonial power? So people see me as being uh, in the public gaze at the moment over the events that went on in Dili in 2004. But really, that that's just one aspect of a wider malaise in our Australian approach to our near neighbours and failed foreign policy. So you've got to see it in perspective. You've had trade issues, export issues, overcoming good conscience. You've had international shareholder um, issues, 
being seen as more important than our national integrity and our national ethical values. So we, way back in the 60s, as soon as we became aware that under that vast granite dome in the Timor Sea, uh, there was so much gas and particularly liquid natural gas trapped along with um, very, very almost equally valuable helium reserves, a very rare and very necessary gas in this nuclear age. And so people often uh, criticise Gough Whitlam. I'm one of his critics, but on a more reasoned basis, I think, that Gough and his advisors just sold Timor out so we could make a deal with the Indonesians for the gas. It's a lot more complex than that. You've got to go back to 1963 at a meeting in Washington, attended by Sir Garfield Barwick, who at that time was both foreign minister and attorney general in Australia, very, very powerful man. And as we know, went on to be chief justice of the high court. In Washington in 63, the administration wanted, uh, the Kennedy administration, wanted to push Portugal's colonies towards independence. They could see that the self-determination struggle would possibly be taken over by uh, the Soviet Union, China, etc., cetera, and, and used as a vehicle to propagate their causes. And so for diplomatic and strategic reasons, the United States asked Australia, asked Garfield Barwick in Washington in, um, in February 63, if we could take the lead, the United States would fund it, and we could assist to bring Portuguese Timor out of the time warp it was in, uh, as we were doing under trusteeship in Papua New Guinea. Barwick said no. He said no. We're not interested in leading the Portuguese Timorese to self-determination. At that time, and for the next few years, Barwick was sitting in cabinet as foreign minister and as a uh, well-briefed commercial silk, a QC, uh, for commercial companies, including exploration companies. He was dealing with the division and maritime boundary in the Timor Sea. And there was no way, in my view, and in the view as the documents reveal, that we wanted an independent Timorese having capacity to fund themselves as a rich mini state on their own gas and oil. Moreover, uh, because the independence movement in Timor was perceived to be on the left, uh, which is no great issue, um, in strategic terms, uh, Barwick was able to uh, accept intelligence advisings that the Indonesians were rapidly anti-Chinese. Of course, as we know, in 1965, over a million uh, Chinese and other Communist Party members perished in a vast pogrom in, in Indonesia. So Australia felt that anti-communist generals were taking power in Indonesia, and it would be better to see Timor in the hands of anti-communist generals than to have a leftist, Bretland-led government in East Timor. And so we, Australia, uh, we were complicit in the takeover by Indonesia, not long after the takeover in 1979, we commenced effective negotiations with Indonesia to try and make a deal in the Timor Sea. And we did with Indonesia, so far as West Timor was concerned, and then there remained the, the infamous Timor Gap. So my book records all of that. Um, it's full of citations and footnotes and um, documents that we can, we have got. The Australian Archives is not a very um, uh, useful place for much research 
on these issues, but a lot more is available in Washington and in the Royal Archives in the United Kingdom. So this was an exercise in historical research for the Timorese to find out what went wrong for them. And uh, Luke, um, there were times when I read documents in uh, overseas that had been redacted or removed or never handed over in compliance with the Federal Archives Act 1983 for archival purposes. I would. Other times I'd see redacted documents in uh, Canberra and I'd have to go to the Royal Archives in Kew and I invariably and often found the unredacted form of it because we had a habit in those years of getting copies to our British colleagues and our United States colleagues in the State Department. But you see, um, the real issue is that back in 63 and 64 and 65, we set about a course of conduct that ultimately led to the sellout. Now, Gough Whitlam's sellout um, marred his career and mars his legacy. And we've got to be very frank about it. Um, you find then contemporary evidence that, and Gough's own evidence many years later in 1999 to a parliamentary inquiry, that he simply regarded Timor, Portuguese Timor, as part and parcel of that group of islands and those peoples. Uh, he didn't put much weight on the fact that uh, Timorese, the, Timor, the, East, the Timorese on the East Island were significantly Christianized. And he didn't put much weight on the fact that if we gave them their oil and gas, they would be self-supportive and, and could make their way. He simply took the imperial view that, well, it belongs with Indonesia. He even said uh, in his retirement in the, during a parliamentary inquiry in 1999, that as an Air Force navigator during World War II, he used to fly over the islands and he regarded them as a group of islands that belonged together. Now, that's a colonial viewpoint and that's a flaw in his uh, legacy. Uh, but I found no evidence that Gough was driven by gas and oil. Sure, his advisors were, and indeed, uh, Leonard Hewitt, then head of our uh, Minerals and Energy uh, Department, was pressing for us to, uh, you know, make sure that we could get as much of the seabed shelf as we could. And of course, our diplomat in Jakarta at the time, Richard Woolcott, um, said very frankly and candidly that we'd be better to negotiate with Indonesians and the Portuguese. So that's a, that was a pretty sad time as well. So Barwick, Barwick's decision uh, not to support American moves to give self-determination to the Timorese in a staggered, developed way, the way we were doing in Papua New Guinea, was the, the real sellout, the real sellout. And the shabby deal with Sahato in 74, 75 by the Whitlam government um, just, you know, put the icing on that, that awful uh, situation. And then you move on to um, Australia's Foreign Affairs Department never hedged its bets. In fact, it helped with the development of the law of the sea, the international law of the sea treaties and international law that of course hung it itself on in the end because those laws clearly indicated that Timor Leste was entitled to the median line, et cetera, et cetera, in a Timor Sea. But we, there was no inkling of that. I remember when I was serving in Paris for about five years in the 70s, the Ayatollah Khomeini would sweep onto my train on the Linda So 
every other morning with all his entourage. The French were giving refuge and asylum to Ayatollah Khomeini. Classic French hedging their bets. What were we doing to our Timorese refugees? We weren't allowing them access as we, first of all, refused them refugee status. And secondly, because they weren't refugees, we delayed, delayed, delayed permanent residence for years and they couldn't access English as second language classes, etc., etc. We didn't hedge our bets. We, we assisted, as Clinton Fernandez um, has written, with um, turning a blind eye to the sufferings and starvations. We seem to have again, again, and again significant foreign policy advising failures. Our foreign policy advising in respect of our region has left us where we are now, despised almost right around the region, despised from uh, Timor Island in the, in the east, all the way across to the Solomons. We've had our Prime Minister Morrison say recently that if the sea, uh, global warming and the sea levels rise, at least we can assist the Pacific Islanders with uh, coming here to pick fruit. I mean, that's neo-colonial attitude. Um, it's an attitude that somehow or other, they are races of people we can exploit. And there's an inherent racism in our approach in our region. We haven't learned to live with our neighbours. We want to dominate them. We've got this relationship with Indonesia that we need to build on and work on and where trust and integrity is vital, particularly in terms of the growing uh, threat to secularisation in Indonesia itself. If we're going to use repressive laws here to uh, smother journalism, to encroach on uh, freedom of expression, to use terrorist laws on lawyers like me, uh, we are telling the Indonesians they can do the same. Uh, uh, your participants, Luke, might be interested to know that on the Friday last week when I got back from my own court hearing that I can't talk about, um, secret one, uh, there was a email from the Hong Kong Bar Association attaching this uh, odious ordinance that's been directed from Beijing, uh, whereby Hong Kong's police and judiciary are going to be directed to give the utmost weight to the national security of China in dealing with protesters and, and freedom of expression and dissent. When I read the translated ordinance three, I, I recognised it. It's very, very similar to the provisions being used against myself at the moment, which allows the Federal Attorney General to declare that um, any information I speak of about what happened in Dili in 2004 uh, would, uh, would be prejudicial to national security. And uh, therefore, um, in assessing that Attorney General's certificate that Christian Porter's issued in respect of my trial for conspiracy, the judge has to give, under another provision of this terrorist law, the greatest weight to the Attorney General's opinion. Now that's the ordinance that's been sent down from Beijing to Hong Kong to be implemented. So that was last uh, Friday week evening, my realization that what are we doing here? Uh, who's leading who? It, it, it was, did we give Beijing the model or are we modeling ourselves now in crushing dissent uh, uh, on some of our less democratic neighbors? That's a foreign policy failure because failing, uh, trialing me, trialing witness K is above all a foreign policy disaster. It's telling everyone in the region, A, what we do, and B, that we don't brook dissent, and that our democracy is very, very fragile.
if it's working effectively in this respect. So, and why, why do we get to this? And can we look for models elsewhere? Well, um, democracy is fragile around the world at the moment and um, uh, the wealthier, uh, the wealthier, uh, the foreign corporations have derived enormous wealth from the Timor Sea, while the Timorese still have significant problems in keeping their infant mortality rate to a reasonable, acceptable figure. It's, uh, I think, uh, Sister Susan described the conduct as despicable. How can you have a foreign policy that supports that? Now, we don't have proper parliamentary oversight of either our foreign policy and its intersection with intelligence activities. We don't have proper oversight. And you've got to give it to the United States. They did have their, their they have had their Watergate inquiries. They have had inquiries. They have exposed issues. And there is a fairly active uh, congressional intelligence security review oversight process. Next to none here in this country. No operational oversight. There's just a few procedural and policy issues uh, uh, flung out to the members of the committee. And uh, uh, that's how we are trying to run our democracy. It's in a conclave. Uh, talk about the Vatican, I mean, uh, there are probably half a dozen people in the real know in Canberra on very important issues. Very, very important issues of, of, of extreme importance to our nation and our future and our relationships. You might have a very small group of senior bureaucrats and maybe a couple of docile ministers who are generally going along with it. That's the way things are run in this country. It's not run that way in the United Kingdom. It's not run that way in the United States. It's certainly not run that way in Germany, France, and other countries' processes that I'm familiar with. We simply elect these officials and they accept the fact that they can't ask too many questions of a number of powerful bureaucrats who really do the settings and look at the result of allowing them to set the settings in the Pacific at the moment. Look at the odious manner in which we are held throughout the region now. And certainly it's something we've been digging since the Octetti mine went in, since the Bougainville mine went in, which since Rio Tinto went into Bougainville. These are uh, foreign policy pitfalls that have been dug long before we started to rip the Timorese off. This is not a legacy that the nasty little whisperers are saying is because uh, someone blew the whistle. The current situation, including the basis for why I'm on trial at the moment, stems from abject failures in our foreign policy. It stems from the fact that lots of very intelligent diplomats have quit or retired over the years. You can ask Richard Butler, Luke. You can ask any number of people, Fitzgerald. You can ask decent diplomats why they uh, ended their careers, why they left early, why they moved on to uh, non-government organisations. There's a wealth of sense out there, but just a small cabal at the moment have uh, got uh, compliant ministers, uh, ministers with no intellectual or uh, skill sets to deal with these issues. And the ministers who need more support, who should open the matter up within their own cabinets, within their own party rooms for debate. And so when I talk about us Australians not knowing, I'm also talking to lots of backbenchers that I know, you may know Luke, right across the political spectrum who don't know what's going on. They're elected to parliament to contribute. And 
uh, certainly the trusted members of parliament across the spectrum who are on the alleged oversight committees have no idea, I say idea, I say it deliberately, of the real goings on in many of the intelligence uh, functions of those usually very good agencies. So um, th there's a, particularly on the left, there's a feeling uh, that we uh, should bag ASIO, for instance, or we bag the spooks. But you've got to see it in perspective. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, ASIO in many respects in its red zone of the bed thing was a disgrace and, 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 and wasn't well run and well managed. But we, we've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to talk to the time when we're talking about our intelligence agencies. I, I can't say too much, but there are equally a number of very good people in all of those agencies, to my knowledge, and who I may know. Um, uh, we've got to be uh, aware and careful. I mean, was it yesterday, um, a motion was moved in our federal parliament to call for a parliamentary inquiry into our relations with China. I'm told the entire crossbench supported it, as did the Greens. I haven't checked that yet, so I've got to say that, Luke, but I got, a, I got an SMS last night and, um, from Rex Patrick's office, I think, and um, Labor and Liberals voted it down. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't understand that. Why don't we deal with these issues now? How could we harm our relationship with China by having an inquiry into our relationship with them? There would be very many positive issues that could be said about our relationship with China. It's, it's not all reds under the bed and they're not all stealing our, our, our technology necessarily. There might be a lot of technology in China we'd like that could be a two-way street. Those things need to be discussed rationally and hopefully without antagonizing the Chinese. But of course, um, you know, the key players who would have insisted that the backbenchers on both sides voted that resolution down have got a lot to be embarrassed by at the moment. Funding for the WA Liberal Party directly from China in past years. You know, we don't hear much about that. It's not just all um, issues involving um, Labor politicians, but that shouldn't be the nature of an inquiry into our relations with China. If China is moving and getting closer relations throughout our region in the Pacific and in Timor, why? Why? What have we done? What, why how are they turning to China? These are reflections that we should be looking at. And I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we haven't had that inquiry launched. The, um, uh, I think many of your um, participants, Luke, tonight would know that uh, the liquid natural gas in the Timor Sea that, you know, Australia was conniving to take had an almost equally valuable helium content that Australia gave away, gave away. So we didn't even steal it for our own people. It was given completely away to foreign based, foreign shareholder held corporations, billions of dollars worth of helium just given away as waste gas. How did that happen? It's explained in my book. And that's what should have the Australian National Audit Office um, examining and whether certain provisions of law are being breached also examined. And uh, my book calls for that. And mind you, Luke, it's just luck of the game that I launched my book in the middle of the, at the beginning of the corona, uh, virus. Um, <laughs> Thing. All the launches were cancelled, but so that was a gift to the coalition, absolute gift. So there you go. 150 people on on this uh, this launch or semi launch. Um, I think we we're told not to call it a launch for some reason. So um, hope that's, not a launch. that's right. They've all got the the, um, uh, the the link to to get a copy and and read further of it. 
Um, thank you very much for that. To wonderful, um, broad picture. I've got some um, fairly, uh, you know, um, direct questions. One, the first one from Sophie Florence Ward, and I'll unmute her and allow her to ask that question herself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yep. Sophie. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, I wanted to ask what would need to be done to start righting the wrongs we have made against Timor Leste. We should uh, have a full judicial inquiry into the making of the various treaties, particularly the last treaty, the 2018 treaty. We should have a full judicial inquiry into how we came to give away so far to Conoco Phillips and a number of contractors, the entire helium stream from the Bayou Yudun uh, field. Now that's a specific remedy that could be done. A judicial inquiry into billions of dollars lost to both us Australians and the Timorese. And so uh, that would be a legitimate and proper inquiry. That, that starts to right the wrongs. The other thing, Sophie, I've said is, how about a national apology? How, how, how about an apology about more than 200,000 deaths in those 25 years of Indonesian occupation? How about a national apology? Th those things count in our region. We should apologize. We really should. There's so much to be done. What about the blackbirding for the sugar cane? I mean, there's so there are a number of matters as a country we need to come to terms with. We became a colonial power when most of the colonial powers were withdrawing. Portugal withdrew from Timor, and what did we do? We put the Indonesians in by proxy, and like neo-colonialists, we got in to share the spoils. We've got to apologise for that, and there should be restitution over, over the gas. And, and oil, and, and we should not allow Australia to plead those releases and indemnity clauses, which no doubt they got in 2018. Australia should frankly apologise and work out a method of making good to the Timorese. I wish we would. Well, there's a, yeah, not insignificant um, restitution, as you say, actions we can take. I have a question from Stuart Russell. Russell, uh, it may be the kind of question which you might have to, at this moment, um, skirt around or avoid directly, but um, I'll uh, let Stuart ask that himself. Bernard, uh, congratulations on the book and bravo to your courage. I'm uh, from the Monetary Committee on Vets and Lawyers of the International Association of People Journalists, along with my colleague, Gil Berger, is present with us today. And we want to extend our complete support and solidarity for you. Um, I'm a lawyer. I understand the nature of the gag order that's been imposed against you. So I understand you may have difficulty answering the, this question. Uh, but what do you think will be the outcome of the trial that has been uh, grotesquely launched against you? Well, I'm charged with conspiring uh, with Witness K to reveal intelligence information. A fundamental issue about the law under which the intelligence service works is that all its actions must be uh, both uh, proper and necessary. And you can't run a... Uh, intelligence service, unless they can read someone's mail, who may be planning a real damage to our country, unless you can climb in a window and which you can bug uh, their bedrooms. And of course, we allow an intelligence agency, if it's proper and necessary, to break the law, if it's proper and necessary. It remains for the court to resolve those issues in terms of whether um, 
what happened um, was unlawful conduct and whether reporting unlawful conduct is a choice or a duty and whether uh, it's proper to use the courts to prosecute someone who reports a crime. So really, um, someone out there summed it up recently and said, uh, is it now a crime to report a crime? I, I can't say more. Uh, I can only say, my dear colleague, um, that there are profound issues at work in relation to trialling me for conspiracy. We understand why the sensitivities around that, but thank you for the answer. I have a question from um, Madeline Goulet, who's the uh, coordinator for the New International Bookshop. Just uh, let her answer that question. Hi, Bernard. Um, Hi, Madeline. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I think you have an absolutely incredible story, and I know it's a long fight, and I can't imagine how you've pushed through for so long, but I find it very inspiring. So I'm so happy to have you here tonight. Um, I was wondering what effects or changes are you hoping your case can influence in regards to whistleblowers? And can you see a way that we can push for the loosening of whistleblower laws and repercussions? Well, firstly, members of the intelligence community have no access to the public interest disclosure reforms that were done in 2014 in the federal parliament. Whistleblowing is a vital thing both in the corporate area and in government because uh, there are diseconomies, there is corruption and there are issues. So Madeline, um, Whistleblowing uh, for the common good is um, laudable and appropriate. But, you know, my mind goes back to, I had a lot of privileged access in the um, 80s. I won't go into it. Um, I was advising in government. Um, during the 80s, as the Soviet Union uh, dissolved, and um, officials from the Russian services were defecting. To keep the troops in order in Moscow, the leadership would say that the Russians who jumped to the West were uh, disgruntled public servants, disgruntled, um, had run off with the embassy funds uh, and made a number of allegations like that. One of the things that distresses me most of all is what is going on in Canberra, which is the, uh, and I'm, I'm not referring to anyone in particular or any case in particular, is the pernicious backgrounding to the media and to the opposition in relation to whistleblowers, be they from uh, a tax department, an intelligence agency, some other government department. Um, we had one recently in our law practice from the finance department. And, and they're seen as uh, unhappy souls. Uh, they're alleged to be disgruntled. They're um, uh, seen as troublemakers. And so that's how the organization fights back, Madeline. We need to amend the, mis the whistleblowing we need to add to the current public interest disclosure protections offences that relate to deliberate criminal defamatory comments made about whistleblowers. And that would obviate the huge price whistleblowers have to pay if we made it an offence for their bosses and others to deliberately, criminally, if you like, although I'm using that loosely, defame the whistleblowers. The only way to make our whistleblowers 
uh, laws more secure is to punish those who seek to use underhand methods to undermine genuine contributing whistleblowers. Madeline. Well, next question is from a comrade who uh, was dragged over the coals for speaking out in Parliament himself about the Balabo Five, uh, former member for Werriwa, uh, uh, Chris, sorry, from MacArthur, Chris Haviland. Uh, Chris, I'd like to ask your question. If I can, um, right, am I unmuted? You are. Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank Chris. you, Bernard. Thanks very much for this evening. Uh, good to see you. And I admire your, uh, your courage and uh, I wish we had more like you. Uh, now, I'm sure there's lots of questions people could ask that you won't be able to answer, so I won't bother with those. Um, but you mentioned 1963, and my memory of 63 when I was a young child was that it was more about West Papua or West Irian or whatever we called it back then. Uh, and I think our culpability that you mentioned about uh, East Timor, I would have thought there's a fair bit of culpability there. Can you uh, perhaps elaborate a bit? To what extent are we culpable in, to, in the, the ongoing um, situation in West Papua, which is where we still hear lots of stories about um, uh, human rights abuses, etc. cetera. And yeah, I went about... through that. I, I actually went through, uh, I talk about the, the archives in The Hague, as well as the archives in Lisbon and London and, and Washington and, and, and Canberra, of course. Um, the archives reveal that Menzies did write to uh, Washington, and asked the Americans to intervene about the expropriation of, of a Dutch property in West Papua and the uh, treatment of the Dutch as the Dutch withdrew. And so the Menzies government was involved in the issue, but as you know, in 62, they had the whole false, re the, the, the fake referendum and the, the handover uh, through a, a shortly staged event of control to the Indonesians. Now, I draw a parallel between those events and what happened in 2002 in Dili, whereby um, there was a stage handover, allegedly necessary, when Bishop Bellow, uh, when uh, uh, Father Frank Brennan, the Jesuit activist, as you know, the International Commission of Jurists, and many people were saying to slow up, the Timorese are still looking for their loved ones, kidnapped people are still across the border, they're not ready for independence yet, uh, just hold it, um, don't hand it over. And, and so all of those warnings said, sadly came true by 2006, Timor was back into violence, and the Australian army had to go back in. Um, so uh, we did it again, but this time we were the, we were the main actors. It wasn't uh, Washington and, and Jakarta and, and uh, Whitehall involved. Canberra did the same in Timor. Um, but in 63, the Australian cabinet called for a, a defense assessment of Indonesia's opposition to the creation of Malaysia because um, Sukarno wanted to have a greater Indonesia Malaysia and he wanted Brunei as part of Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was this big uh, four power meeting in Washington, Australia, New Zealand, uh, United Kingdom and United States. And that was the meeting that effectively sealed the fate for the Timorese that I've mentioned, Garfield Bowie, refusing to give them independence. And that was the meeting that more or less signed off on handing over West Papua fully, no staged handover as originally promised. And we, we, we pretty well abandoned the Dutch in that. The Dutch wanted a staged devolution of power and the Dutch wanted to have a proper referendum, right? And But the, the main powers and the UN General Assembly um, effectively 
pushed for premature handover to Indonesia. But that's what happened. That, that's, that's part of history. Um, I've, I've given the citations there in the book. Um, and and you, you're saying, what can we... It, it, this is a major issue coming up for us. That, that, that there's got, we, we've got uh, very little respect in the region now, and we've got to work out uh, from a moral and an ethical point of view, how are we going to approach the problems in West Papua? We just need to sort that out. Yeah, well, there's a, uh, search members are campaigning on, on that issue as well. Maybe we should do a, a future forum and get some um, people to speak on that. There's been a lot of questions about West Papua, actually. Um, I have a question from, uh, and we're getting toward the end of, of the forum. Um, so I'll, I will mention again that uh, I will switch the chat so that everyone can message everyone and people can send messages to Bernard directly. There's a lot of messages of support for you, Bernard, I should say, people expressing, and soon people will go to send those directly. Um, but I have a question from, from Peter Murphy, who's a member of the search uh, committee, about the timing. Why do you think a prosecution was launched against you and Witness K soon after the seaboard, seabed border was agreed? Um, my book was in draft form in the cloud with the publisher. I got a letter from the Australian government solicitor telling me uh, that I would face a 10 year penalty um, if I published or if the publication breached the law. I wrote back and said I didn't propose to breach the law. Um, I didn't revise the manuscript. I don't want to be um, sort of uh, psychotic or anything, but I just assume uh, they could get into the cloud and read the manuscript, which had gone to the publishers at uh, then Monash University Press. And so I assume they got hold of the original manuscript. And then, of course, uh, on that fateful night, the police came here and knocked on the door and served me with a summons for conspiracy. That was in May 2018. And uh, uh, Turnbull was the Prime Minister at the time. I think Julie Bishop was his Foreign Minister and Peter Dutton in that Home Affairs Department. So all those players had to be involved in the prosecution. They would be consulted uh, with the Attorney General. And um, what it meant was uh, Turnbull didn't do a spy catcher to me. He couldn't. It would have been vastly damaging. But by issuing a summonses against me, it made, it made everything I would say thereafter sub -judice. So that was it. The book fell over, and um, uh, and enormous credits to Melbourne University Press. Uh, so we brought the manuscript from Monash to Melbourne University, and very courageously, MUP has published the book. And you've got to understand the environment in which publishers and the media work now. You've got these these eighteen laws we brought in since nine eleven wider, worse than any in any Western democracy, trust me, 18 laws. And, and uh, because both major parties are terribly embarrassed by um, all the funding and support they've had from China, they brought these foreign interference laws in with a lot of cunning moves in it to make the sort of work that lawyers do for sovereign governments, say in the, the Pacific or up in our near north, uh, that can now be uh, sabotage, it can now be uh, espionage, it, it can now be a breaches of national security, and we can be tried like I am, and lawyers can be. Um, so that piggyback in on laws that really should have been in to stop China and foreign companies, mostly Chinese, funding the Liberal and Labour parties. I mean, they're the ones embarrassed by it. It should never have happened. And now brought in laws that they'll never use on themselves. 
crossbench, as I said, tried to get an inquiry going. That was voted down 24 hours ago. And uh, we, we just, we live in a very fragile democracy at the moment. We truly do. I'm just uh, tossing up in my own mind. I've got one last question. It's a bit of an historical question from Dr. Helen Hill. Uh, go ahead, Helen, and make that our last one. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Bernard. Uh, as you'll be aware, here in Dili, in the Museum of the Resistance, is the famous photograph of Gareth Evans and Ali Alatas drinking champagne as they fly over the the Timor Sea, where the, the Timor Gap, rather, uh, and, and Timorese always remember who Gareth Evans is. Now, I was very pleased to see, read last week, that he's actually attended your case and is, is on your side. I don't know whether you're able to say anything about this, but uh, what is the current thinking of Gareth Evans on the issue? If you're, if you're allowed to say this, I know there's a lot of things you can't talk about. Uh, it's wonderful to see that? you, Helen. Uh, uh, you're an indefatigable supporter and worker for justice, and I'm, yeah. I'm so yes, I'm in Dilly still. Yeah, I'm privileged, Helen, to 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 get a question from you. You wonderful woman. Now, look. Uh, let me say this: I can't say a word about what Gareth's evidence was. Now, Gareth and I have shaken hands. Um, we've we've been nice to each other because you'll know that we sparred so much over the years. Um, I, um, I, uh, I'm deeply grateful to him. I didn't speak to him before he came forward to give evidence um, in my case. Um, others did it. Um, you know, we're all allowed to, I'm not gonna use the word redemption, I mean, we're all allowed to uh, develop as human beings. And I, I, when I sat there talking outside the court in um, um, my uh, in councils, in my barristers conference room, uh, I thought uh, Gareth has changed so much. He's changed a lot. Helen, I'd love to tell you what he said in court, but I go to jail. <laughs> I can't tell you. Um, but, um, you know, that makes a big difference, Helen, to what I was telling Luke earlier. I was in a lineup to meet Mary Robinson quite a few years ago uh, with my wife to meet. She was the president then of Ireland, and we were lining up in the Hyatt Hotel to meet her. And um, I was talking to a very eminent High Court justice. Uh, who was next to me uh, with his wife and um, Gough Whitlam swept in and um, walked past the line. He wasn't going to get into a queue with the rest of us, but he must have thought he better not go past the justice. So he stopped and that uh, judge said, well, listen, uh, I've just been talking to Bernard here. Why don't you shake his hand and settle things? And Gough wouldn't shake my hand. Wouldn't shake my hand. So, but Gareth's a different man, right? That's all I can say. Let's, um, there's some progress in some places. Um, we are now very close to the, the end. That's our last question. Unfortunately, we've had so many wonderful questions. As I've said, um, you can now post uh, messages directly to Bernard uh, via the chat section, all those wonderful messages of support uh, and, and comradeship and solidarity that we're getting through. Uh, it was great to have our last question coming from uh, Dilly itself. Um, I'd like to thank Bernard Clary, the New International Bookshop. I'll post again the link so you can buy the book from the New International Bookshop. Uh, Pollyanna Clayton Stam, of course, is there with Bernard. Um, Sarah Val and Brian McDonald from Melbourne University Press, Andy Alcock uh, and everyone who came along. Um, as I said, you can message everyone now. This will be up on YouTube by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, please like the search Facebook page to find out about our next event, which should be in two weeks time. Um, now what we do is we've, I flick to a song, um, but I'll let, uh, before I do that, I'll let uh, Bernard have the final word. And then um, while that song is playing and uh, you can either leave the meeting or you can exchange messages uh, with people in the chat section uh, as much as you like. So 
Thank you so much, Bernard. I'll let you have the final word and then I'll, uh, I'll start playing a, an outro song, as they say. Well, great, Luke. Can I say that rule of law is universal? It, it doesn't belong to any section of society. It doesn't belong to any political party. Our forebears wanted a country that abided by the rule of law and we act according to the rule of law. The real issue is, um, are we acting as a country according to the rule of law these days across every front? Are we? Are we? You know, what is the rule of law? And, and you know, put, put, for one example, the robo-debt uh, scandal. It, was that in accordance with the rule of law to judge people according to some algorithmic calculation? So we forget how we get away from the rule of law. The, the rule of law suggests that you can't punish people using an algorithm. Well, uh, how can you punish people um, who come forward and state something is immoral and unlawful? Do we have true rule of law? And the one person that really we should be supporting and for those who want to be praying for is Witness K. Imagine what Witness K is going through. Imagine the leverage on that person. Imagine, imagine it. And read Solzhenitsyn, I'd say. You get an idea of, of what happened to Russians who spoke up all through those years. Brilliant, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for being there. And thanks for taking the time out. Obviously you're very busy at the moment. A lot of, a lot of messages about um, how you're handling the pressure we couldn't get to, but um, I expect you're under a fair amount. So thank you so much for that. As I said, we'll now flip to a, a, a song and during that time, people can uh, either leave or they can use the chat section to um, uh, send messages to you, Bernard, and to, uh, and to each other indeed, both publicly and privately. And as I said, this will be available on the uh, Search Facebook YouTube channel as of, uh, tomorrow. Thanks again. Thanks, Lee.